Today's video is going to be all about watercolor supplies. Now, I do apologize if my voice sounds a little bit off. I have been sick the last week, but we're just going to have to roll with it. Now, I did a poll over on my community tab, and you guys wanted me to include some swatches in this haul, so that's what we're going to do. We're now, a lot of this came from Black Friday deals and Christmas, but we'll go over all of the supplies first, and then I'll save the swatching towards the end of the video. So I've got a few different brush sets here, and I've got some that are a little more affordable like these two but I just want to cover these ones first so if you guys watch my channel at all you know I love my silver black velvet brushes but funny enough I've never had a size six so these were on sale so I went ahead and picked um, up a size six I also really like the Princeton Neptune brushes and I will have all of these supplies linked down in the description below but I really was intrigued by this one so this is a dagger brush and it's got like a slanted point there and I've never tried a dagger brush before so I really wanted to try this one and then I've got a few liner brushes just to have and this is the Princeton Heritage I'm not sure if I have any of these brushes as well but that one kind of caught my eye now this Princeton Neptune here this is a script brush but um, it's kind of looking a little worn already so let me know if you guys want a video showing you how I would like reshape this brush now maybe once I get this wet this will reshape a little bit nicer but I can show you how I would do that uh, as well now my main brushes that I use are the silver black velvet but I've been asked quite a lot to see if there's any synthetic brushes that are about the same quality of the silver black velvet because to me these are top of the line watercolor brushes that I have personally ever used so when I found these ones online, I was very intrigued because a lot of the reviews on Amazon were comparing these to the silver black velvet brushes and these are super affordable. So I'll get into these in a second, but I wanted to go ahead and pick up these artist loft brushes. Now these say they are watercolor brushes and they look like they have like a pretty nice point to them. So I wanted to go ahead and give these a try as well. We've got a size one, two, three, four, five, seven, nine, and 11 here. And they do say they are for watercolor. And I've never tried these brushes before. And I want to say these brushes were maybe around like the seven, eight dollar mark. Now that's Canadian dollars. So convert that to whatever currency you have. But I thought it would be fun to try like a super affordable and then a, a more like medium affordable range of brushes. Now, interestingly, these come in this tube and I haven't opened these yet, but this is the Artigra Intuition series. And it does say they are premium quality watercolor brushes. I'm really, I've never seen brushes come in a bag like this and I don't know what you would use the bag for once you've opened it because I wouldn't be putting my brushes in here. And it looks like they come in all separate little pouches here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and take these out so you can see them a little better. Okay, so these are the 10 brushes that come in the kit. We have a three quarter flat. We have a number six flat. We have a three quarter oval wash. Now this kind of reminds me of like a cat's tongue. We have a three eighths dagger brush. Oh, that's cool. So now I'll have two dagger brushes to play around with. We have a 12 round brush. We have a 10 round, an eight round, a six round, a three round, and a zero round brush. Now I wish the hair on this brush was just a little bit longer because it would be easier to get finer lines, but I do like that they included a wide variety of sizes here. Now I'm really interested to try these out because they did say that they mimic synthetic squirrel hair. So the silver black velvet brushes that I use unfortunately are not synthetic brushes, but these are, and a lot of the reviews were comparing these to the silver black velvets. So I'm really interested in giving these a good try out and if you want to see that video make sure you're subscribed and hit the notification bell so you don't miss it and I just realized I could put these brushes in this tube because I was wondering what I'm going to use this tube for I don't know if I'd put the top on it but you could just leave this on your desk like that so that's pretty cool that you can reuse this for that and I guess you could even go in and maybe color these little fans that might be really fun to do as well all right so this is some of the new palettes that I've gotten now if you watch my channel you know I really love this style of palettes I've got some smaller ones like this and a couple of bigger ones and I've actually got a new porcelain palette that I'm gonna be trying out that I'll show you in a minute but these are really nice I like this small one for a more limited palette 
It's got a couple different wells here. Now, the other one that I have, this is not clear, it's white, but it does have a little insert here that you can pop out. So you could use this as a separate tray or you could use this one underneath. It's interesting that this one included the clear tray, whereas the last time I bought this uh, palette, it was a white tray, an extra white tray. So I really love this style. They close, they lock well. Now, this is the Joy Arts one. This is an 18 well palette. Um, and here's the information just in case you're curious. Again, I will link everything down below. And I got two more of my tried and true big palettes. Now these are the 33 well big palettes and these are from Medine. And just in case you're curious, that's the model number and the colors that you can get. And I absolutely love this purple color. Now these are a little bit bigger than the other ones, but this is great if you wanna put like a whole brand in here or just have lots of options. And spoiler alert, we will be using one of these palettes to do some swatching. And yes, I got more than 33 <laughs> paints. These ones also have the insert that just pops out so you can have some extra space here. Now, one thing I do love about these bigger palettes is this insert actually will pop out here. And I like to actually flip it around to have the paint palettes going this way. So when I put my paint in here, it's just easier to get my brush in rather than having it um, this way and you're kind of digging your brush over this well. So that's just a little thing that I like to do. I like to flip it around. And again, you could always take this out and just have it on the side and have some extra mixing space, but I typically leave it right in there and it just pops back in really nicely. And one thing about these palettes is they are sturdy. So everything fits nice and tightly, but you can still get it out. It's not going to pop out on you at all. And they close up and seal really well. So I have one in purple here and one in black. Just to show you what I mean when I say I like these palettes, I like them a lot because I have four more of them. So this is where I keep my brands of watercolors. So I have one for each brand. And then I'm thinking of getting one to do like a mixed palette. So we'll see how that goes. But you know I like it when I have a lot of them. Now I'm super excited for this palette and this is a porcelain palette. Now I may have slightly misjudged how big this is gonna be, but let me just get it out and show you. So it comes very nicely packaged, I love that. And this is what the palette looks like. This is super well made, very sturdy. And I like that it's got three separate wells here. It's almost like the smaller palettes that I got, except it doesn't have the little areas to put your paint in. But what I'm thinking to use this for, either three color paintings where I could have like a yellow, red, a blue, or even a split palette where you've got three cools and three warms. And I thought this would be great because I could divide all the paint out on here and just try some fun paintings like that. So let me know if you want to see some videos like that coming up, or you could even just use this as your mixing palette. And I might do that in a few videos as well. And it is pretty big. So it's about 10 inches or 10.3 inches by 7.3 inches and 0.6 inches thick, but if I compare it to one of these bigger 33 well palettes, it's not quite as long, just so that you have sort of a comparison of how big this is, but I'm so excited to use this. This is some of the new watercolor paper that I've gotten. Now, a couple of them are my tried and true papers that I always get, but I have a few brands in here that are new to me and I'm really excited to try out. So this is the Academy watercolor paper. Now, this is actually made from Ba Bao Hung. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but this is their student brand. And I apologize if it's shiny because I still have the seal on it. I keep that on until I'm ready to open them and use them. But this is 100% cotton cold pressed paper. And this is my number two favorite paper. So I love my Arches paper but it is a little expensive. This is a super affordable version and I have two of them because again, that's how much I like it. Now the Academy watercolor paper actually comes with these little inserts that you can go along and remove your paper with. I love that they come with this and it makes it super easy to get the paper out. And these each come with 20 papers and I have lots of videos on my channel of using this. Now this is new to me. So this is the Bahong paper, but this is their artist watercolor paper. Now again, this is 100% cotton paper and it's cold pressed. So I wanted to really see the difference between their student brand and their artist brand because I love their student brand. So I have really high expectations for their artist brand. And I haven't seen a lot of watercolors use this paper or 
I just haven't noticed that they've been using this paper. So I'm really excited to try this out. Now, I don't remember if it was this paper or the next one that I'm going to show, but they one of them came with this um, edge. It almost looks like a knife to kind of get in there and get it out. So that's kind of nice as well. And it's not super sharp, so that would work well too, I'm assuming. Now I do have a video on my channel showing you how to remove paper from watercolor block, and I'm just using a butter knife. That's really all you need. It's super simple, super easy, so I'll make sure to link that down below just in case you're curious. The next paper that I have here, and I'm not sure if this is new from Paul Rubens, but I have their watercolor paper book. And I was kind of like, what do you mean book? It looks like it's all glued in all around the sides. I love that it's got like a hard cover to it though. And, oh, oh, okay. I see why now. So it says watercolor book. I thought it was gonna be a watercolor pad. It says that it has 20 cold pressed, 100% cotton papers. But as I just opened it up, there is this gorgeous artwork here. So I wonder, is this all artwork or is it actual paper? Oh, it's got some interesting stuff here. It says moisture proof, sun protection, preservation. Uh, it says preservation twice and protection. So I'm not sure if this is actual watercolor paper or not. You know what? Let's go ahead and take this first sheet off and see what's underneath because I'm really curious now. Okay, so it is just watercolor paper underneath and it looks like the Paul Rubens type paper, like their normal paper but I'm really sad as you can see here I kind of destroyed this a little bit but I think why this was so difficult coming off is it is super thin and flimsy paper whereas watercolor paper is usually around 140 pounds this is probably like a 60 maybe even less than a 60 pound paper so I think it was just so tightly glued onto here that it was just really difficult to come off but that is super cute that they added like a little print on top of their block if you guys have ever tried these watercolor books from paul rubens let me know if all the pictures in them are the same or they're different if they're different i might have to open this one up and just see what's in there next up i've got my tried and true my love my arches watercolor paper now i try not to use this too too much because i know a lot of people can't afford arches and they're trying to find more affordable brands but this is hands down my absolute favorite go-to paper so whenever it's on sale i stock up so i've got a 7 by 10 here and a 9 by 12. these are usually my two go-to sizes when i'm doing paintings or sometimes i'll choose like a 5 by 7 or sometimes 6 by 9. you can take this uh, 9 by 12 cut it in half then you've got two 6 by 9 pieces of paper to use and that's usually a pretty good size to paint on as well this is new to me and i've been trying this out over the last couple of of weeks and I've tried artist loft watercolor paper in the past and it's a no-go for me however this is a hundred percent cotton watercolor paper from artist loft I had no idea that they made a hundred percent cotton watercolor paper and this is in a block a block now the price point of this at my local Michaels because that's where I got this in Canada was around 80 some dollars and they charge for about the same size arches block a hundred between 110 and 120, I think. So this is priced a little bit up there, in my opinion, for an artist loft paper. However, if this is truly quality paper, then that's a, a pretty good price, I think. Now this is 20 sheets, it's 12 by 16, and it does say that it is mold made, but a lot of 100% uh, cotton cold press paper is mold made. Now I do like the feel of this paper. This feels a little bit between like an Arches texture paper and Paul Rubens. I would say Paul Rubens is very textured and Arches is a little bit less and this seems between those. One thing I do wanna point out here that I do like about this paper, this is Arches paper and this is a little tutorial that'll be coming up in the future. So subscribe if you wanna see that. But you can see the difference here between the Arches cold press paper and the Artist Loft paper. This is such a white paper and I never realized how off-white my Arches paper was until I picked this up. But I will have a full review coming up of this paper and comparing it to a couple of other brands so make sure you don't miss that. Now we're getting to the paints. Now these are just some loose paints that I've picked up and I love my Winsor Newton Professional paints. So I've got Van Dyke Brown, Viridian, Perlene Maroon, Olive Green, 
cadmium scarlet, quinacridone gold, cobalt violet, Windsor green yellow shade, permanent carmine, phalo turquoise, burnt umber, and kaput mortem violet. This looked like such a pretty color. I cannot wait to play with this. Sort of like a purpley brown, beautiful. And then I was looking for the Naples Yellow in the Windsor & Newton, and I couldn't find it, so I ended up grabbing this Naples Yellow Hue from Grumbacher because I really wanted to try this color out. Now, I don't use a lot of iridescent paint, but when I saw this on Amazon, it really caught my eye. Now, this is Honey Made Watercolor, and I'll go ahead and link them down below, but the colors here just looked absolutely gorgeous. I hope that is coming across on the camera. They looked so pretty, so I am so excited to try these out and swatch them. And these pans are full, like they are super full. So I definitely got my money's worth here. I feel like these were really affordable. Now I know prices on Amazon do change, um, but when I picked these up, they were super affordable, so I'm excited to try these out. Now, I've never tried the Paul Rubens paint, and funny enough, I actually showed this in my last haul, I believe, and I put this away and completely forgot about it. So I'm bringing it out again because it's sort of newly discovered to me again. So this is their 24 pans of paint. And oh, I like that. It comes very packaged nicely. A very nice pink tin and it opens up here and it's got some nice wells to use one thing i don't like about these tins is sometimes they don't lay completely flat so all of your paint is going to come down and pool here now you may be able to stretch it a little bit and same on this side if you push down on it it's going to move um, but if you're gentle i guess you could use these little spots here comes with a couple of inserts so let's see what this is Oh, that's showing all of the paints. Now, I wonder if this is all of the colors in their range, but I cannot read any of that. So if you want to see all of the colors that are available, I'll just hold this up for a second, but I can't read any of this except for like the pigment numbers. So I wish they would have included a, an English version in this because they've got some information here, but again, I can't read that. They've got another little insert here with some information that I can't read. Oh, it looks like maybe like a swatching thing. Okay. That's kind of neat that they've included some swatching paper and it'll fold up and fit right into your palette. This does not feel like the best paper to me though, so I'll probably create my own paper for that. And these are all of the colors. They are so pretty. Like look at these blues and these greens. Oh, these greens look gorgeous here. And some nice reds. Like all of the colors just look really nice. There's a nice range of colors. We've got some dark colors here. They could have left out the black because I can make my own black, but it's nice that they include it for people that want it. But this is just a really nice range of colors in a small palette format. And I'm really excited to get in and try these paints. Now, this is the one that I am the most excited about. And as you can see, it is the Holbein Artist watercolors. Now this set comes with 30, but I did opt to grab a couple more just to try them out. So this is Emma Dazalone Yellow, and this is Quinacridone Red. They seemed like very pretty colors. And there wasn't too many yellows and reds in this set here. Now, as you can see, these are the colors that it came with. It comes with a pretty nice range of colors. And I've heard that the quality of these paints are very nice. Now, I've never personally tried them, so I will be making a whole review video on these once I give them a good try, but I am so excited to have them. Now, as you can see, the ones that come in the set here are very small, so this is a 15 mil tube, and these are, I think, 5 mil tubes. So they're comparable to about the size of the Windsor Newton Professionals, and they last a really long time because you only need a little bit of paint at a time. 
Now, these are meant to be used straight out of the tube. However, I do like to put them in a palette and let them dry out. I've heard some people have trouble re-wetting them, but I've never noticed that. And I'm wondering if it's just because I use these paints the most, so maybe I'm just used to it. But all I really need is just a little bit of water on my brush and I swirl it in the palette and it re-wets super easily for me. So I don't know if they've changed their formula over time because a lot of my Winsor & Newtons are fairly new within the last year, year and a half. So that could be the difference, but it's something to be aware of that they are meant to be used out of the tube. However, paints like these are meant to be squeezed into pans or palettes and used from dry. But to be honest, I don't notice a difference doing that with these ones. Now these do come with English information on it, so I can tell it's permanent green too. I can tell the pigment name here, and it's got, it looks like semi-opaque maybe, and then it's got a couple of stars for the permanence and the series. I wonder if there's more information in here about that. Okay, it does come with a little guide on how to read your tube, so that's great. And it does say here that the Holbein Artist watercolors are produced using simple combination of the finest pigments and gum arabic, so these are gum arabic watercolors they contain no synthetic polymers and only use a small amount of surfactants allowing the artist more control over the dispersal of their watercolors while maintaining color integrity intensity and the highest permanency ratings and that's one thing i have heard about these watercolors is if you're doing a lot of wet on wet they don't travel a lot and that's what i like about the windsor newton watercolors is i can get some very controlled wet on wet paintings and so I'm hoping that these are going to react the same way. And that's what I've heard that they do. Now, if you're used to using like M. Graham paints or Daniel Smith, they do travel in water a little bit more and disperse. And I like that effect when I'm looking for that. So that's why I still have some of those paints. And the M. Graham paints are some of my favorite paints. But you'll notice when you dab it on like a wet paper, it just spreads and it can give a lovely effect. But when I want more detailed paintings, I like to choose paints that don't spread as much. So I'm really excited to get into these. And I think I'll just go ahead and squeeze these into one of the palettes that I got earlier in this haul. And we'll make up a swatch card. And I just want to get into swatching these. So I think these will be the ones that I swatch in this video. And then all of the other ones I'll do in another video. And through the powers of editing, we will get right to swatching them. Okay, so I've got all of the Holbein paints in a palette here, and as you can see, the colors look very vibrant just on their own in the palette. I can say I had no trouble squeezing these out at all. No binder came out. Like, they were all mixed very well. Now, they didn't uh, dry completely, so these set up more like M. Graham, where they're still a little bit tacky if you touch them, and I think that's because of the gum arabic that's in them, and so these should be a lot easier to re-wet, so that's a positive for these. I've gone ahead and done my swatch card up. Now, I may not keep the ivory black or the Chinese white here in the palette because I don't typically use those with watercolors. If I'm going to use white, I'll use something like gouache or bleed proof white to go over on top of my watercolors if I really want an opaque white but i'm interested in trying this chinese white out because i have heard that it's good to mix with other colors if you want to get more of like a pastel version so i might play around trying that but uh, i don't know if i'll keep those two colors in here so i may switch them out eventually if i get any more whole by paints and I've gone ahead and just put a black line here just to see how opaque the white is. But let's just get right into the swatching part. And I'm just using my Princeton Neptune size 8 brush here. I like using this brush for swatches because it doesn't hold as much water as my silver black velvets. So I find I get a better swatch using this. And I'm just going to move my water jugs over a little bit here. And I like to just lay some water down first and then go in and swatch the paint so they kind of blend out a little bit easier for me. And I might do some laying down some water first and some not laying down water first just so I can kind of see the difference how these paints flow. So this is the lemon yellow. Now when I do the review video for these paints, I will go a little bit more in depth on like pigment numbers and all that. But today I just want to see 
how these colors lay down and how they look. So that is a very nice typical lemon yellow. I'm gonna lay some more water down and I just do my swatches right next to each other. I just try to keep them within the lines. Now this is the Imidazolone Yellow, which is a little bit of a mouthful to say, but it looks like a very nice warm yellow. That is very pretty. I'm gonna try swatching this one <clears throat> without putting water down first. Now this looks like almost like maybe a little bit more like quinacridone gold, but not quite as brown. It's got like a hint of brown in it. And I am swatching these on Arches cold pressed paper as well. So then I'm just gonna take some of the clean water and run it up here and then just coax this color down and I find doing it this way sometimes I get a softer gradient it just depends with yellows it's hard to get a really really nice uh, gradient as well but that's kind of nice it's got like a touch of brown in it kind of pretty I think I do like putting the water down first and then going in with the colors but uh, I should be grabbing from my clean jar <laughs> thank goodness these are all yellows at this point. So this is the permanent yellow deep. And really all I need to do is just touch the tip of my brush to these colors. They are re-wetting so nicely. I'm not going to go all the way down because I want to see if that color is going to draw down a little bit. But they are so pigmented. That's like a really nice uh, like sunflower yellow. So I would say this one and this one lean slightly cooler. That one's maybe a little warm. Like that's got a little bit of a cool undertone, but it also looks like it could go warmer too. Uh, so I'm gonna grab some of my actual clean water here to put some water down. I'm gonna try putting a little bit more than I have done, uh, just to see if I can get these paints to flow a little bit. But when I was looking at the information for them, it does say that these paints are designed to kind of stick in place a little bit more so they're not as flowy. This is the vermilion hue. This is a really pretty um, soft warm red. Yeah so if I just drop that down like it it barely moves. So these could be really great if you like to do a lot of wet on wet And I feel like this red would be really nice too for mixing some skin tones maybe. And I want to get into doing more portraits this year. I don't really do a whole lot of portraits, but I find they're just so beautiful too. I'm just trying to get a bit of a soft gradient there. I'm just going to try to soften out this bottom part here. See if I can get a little bit of a gradient going on with this color. There we go. So I'm going to do, I think, a few more swatches more dry on the paper. So this is the quinacridone red. Oh, and this is very pink. This is really pink. I wasn't expecting that. I knew it was going to be... Um, a quinacridone red is usually more on the pink side, but I wasn't expecting it to be so pink. I would almost call this like a magenta type color, and this is really pretty. This is right up my alley. This and a nice teal blue. Mm. Love it. 
So I'm just gonna dip into the clean water there and I just run my brush off on the side and I find that's enough to get uh, most of the water out. And if I do this quick enough, then I usually don't get any blooms. But I really don't mind if I get blooms uh, in my swatches because they're just swatches. And I like, like at the end, leaving a little drop of water in there because it'll show some pigments uh, bloom a little bit easier than others. So that way I can tell how easy these paints are going to bloom if I lift up my brush and a little bit of extra water comes out at the end. It kind of gives me a little idea of uh, how these paints are going to move and um, how I can use them doing wet on wet. So this is the Rose Matter. Oh, and this is even it looks a little bit more red than the quinacridone red does so that's kind of interesting I'm trying to get a good amount on my brush here oh that is a pretty color kind of reminds me of like a an alizarin crimson but maybe slightly pinkier undertone hmm. I'm just gonna run that on the side <clears throat> and again, I apologize for my voice. I'm still not feeling 100%, but sometimes you just got to get get the content out. <laughs> so I may have to stop and get a little bit of water. Actually, I will get some water here and there. But I wanted to do these swatches in real time with you. because I do find these videos really relaxing. So this is the Crimson Lake. And all of these reds seem to be a little bit on the pinky side. Oh, that is a really nice deep pink red. And then as you can see, when I lift my brush, it kind of just drops a little bit of extra water in there. And I can just see if it'll bloom or not. And that, that's why I also like using this brush too, because it doesn't leave a lot of extra water when I uh, do that. So this is the Quinacridone Opera. This is a beautiful pink color, but I highly doubt that this one is going to be light fast now when i was looking at this online a lot of these colors did show as light fast and again i'll touch on that in the actual review video when i get that out so make sure you um hit the notification bell so you don't miss that video if you're interested but most of the opera colors because they're so bright it's really hard um to make them light fast I don't know of any brands that has like an opera pink type color or any opera colors that are light fast to my knowledge. So if you guys know of any, please let me know down below in the comments because I would love to pick them up because I love those bright colors. But unfortunately, they will fade over time. Now, if you're making digital prints or digital art, like if you're going to scan your art and sell, the, sell it digitally, then that doesn't matter. Um, it's just if you're selling the originals, then unfortunately, you know, within a couple of years, sometimes even within a year, some of those paints, the, the colors fade a lot. So this is the Cobalt Violet Light. And this is a really pretty, like almost, it's almost a little bit muted. I feel like there's definitely some white in here it seems a little bit more opaque I want to get a little bit more at the top here yeah I feel like this color is a little bit more opaque perhaps but it definitely is a very pretty color. I find this one's 
not laying down quite as nicely as some of the other ones. And I'll have to check to see what pigments in here after, but there we go. So I got it a little bit smoother, so you can go over these colors a little bit, so that's nice. This is the Mineral Violet. Oh, that is a very pretty purple as well. This is almost like a dusky purple. Very pretty. Love it. Now, I did notice this set is missing a, a true like violet color, like your Windsor Violet. Um, however, I'm sure with some of these reds and blues, I will be able to, um, well, that is a lot of water on that one. I'm just going to pick some of that up. I should be able to mix up one on my own. So maybe I'll do like a little video, um, of mixing some of these colors to make some like more traditional colors, like the Windsor Violet and stuff like that. So if you want to see that video, let me know. I can already see in this one. I think this one is going to slightly granulate because I can see some little pigment particles already. So that's kind of interesting because I didn't think any of these colors would granulate. But I'm definitely seeing it in that one. All right, so we're down here to the Prussian blue. This is a pretty blue as well. It almost reminds me of the Windsor & Newton... Um, phalo blue but maybe slightly darker and I'm comparing a lot of these to the Windsor & Newton professional watercolors because those are the ones that I use the most I think this is just more of like a little muted than that color um, but if you guys want a comparison video between them like between the pigments and stuff I can do that as well so let me know in the comments just dabbing a little bit of that water off on a paper towel there. This is a really pretty blue color too. And I'm really having to like coax that color down because it's not moving a whole lot. Um, so I find these paints are doing a little bit better when I'm going in with water and coaxing them down, but I'm really interested to try them uh, wet on wet when I want my paints to stay in place. Um, so a lot of my backgrounds that I do, I don't want my color to kind of uh, spread out too, too much. So that's why I use a lot of the Windsor & Newtons for that because they don't travel as well. And oh, this Ultramarine Deep is super pretty as well. And I don't have an Ultramarine Deep, I don't think. So it's just like a very dark, deep warm blue and you can see putting it down next to the Prussian blue um, just the difference between warm and cool. Now a lot of people call ultramarine warm, some people call it cool. I don't think it really matters. It's just uh, this is the color that's going to give you better purples. So a warmer, I call this a warmer blue because it's closer to purple and reds on the color wheel. So that's how I see it and define it in my eyes. I'm going to grab a little bit more just to get that a little smoother. Um, so yeah, I call it warm, but it doesn't matter. But this, if you're looking to make nice purples, a, a nice ultramarine will usually get you there. And this one looks like it may granulate a little bit, and that's normal for most ultramarine colors as well. So that's totally fine. Uh, I find the Winter and Newton ones not very much granulating, like there might be a hint of granulation in there. So if you're looking for one that doesn't granulate, uh, that's definitely one to check out, the Winter and Newton Professional. The Cotman one as well, uh, it's just a little less pigment than the Professional. This is Cobalt Blue Hue. Ooh, okay, this is more like the Phalo Blue from Windsor & Newton, definitely. It's got a little bit more of that vibrancy to it. 
Oh, that is so pretty. I actually just used this color to do a one color uh, landscape. So it was a video where we just used one color and we just did a simple landscape. And it turned out really nice and it's uh, super easy. Anyone can follow along with it. So um, you guys can check that out if you want. And I also did a follow-up video, which isn't out yet. That might be next week's video. And I did the same thing, but it's a more advanced landscape where we go in and we do a lot more like trees and foliage. And we're only using one color for that one as well. But it's sort of how you can go from the beginner version and level it up to the more advanced version or intermediate version. So if you're interested that if it's not out already, it will be out uh, probably the next video. This is really nice, but it's definitely got a lot of white mixed into that. You can tell it's like super opaque. This is the cerulean blue. Now, one of my favorite cerulean blues is actually the Winsor Newton Cotman cerulean blue. That is such a pretty blue. It is a very light, very transparent, even very pigmented cerulean blue. I like it over the professional cerulean blue and it's still light fast and all that good stuff. Uh, most of the Cotman colors surprisingly are light fast. They're the same quality as the professional. The only difference is there's more binder and less pigment in them. So they're just a little less pigmented, but the Cotmans are still really nice watercolors um, to start out with. And that's what I started out with. And then as I wanted to try new colors, I would buy, you know, a couple of the professionals here and there. And then um, I got them on a really good sale. So I bought a bunch. So that's how I ended up getting a bigger palette for them. But you can just start off with one or two colors here and there. But that's a really nice color. But I wish they wouldn't have added white to it. I'm assuming they added white to it. I'll have to check the pigment numbers because um, it just makes it a little more like dusky looking I really like um because I love cerulean blue if I'm doing like skies it makes such a pretty sky color um but I find more opaque like that hmm. okay what am I doing I'm skipping here I don't want that one I want compost blue which is this one here this is an interesting color too and it looks like they added white to this one too maybe looks a little bit more opaque now that's interesting that's a that's a pretty color too though it's almost leaning towards like uh, teal a little bit if you add a little bit of green to that I think that might be a really pretty combination Yeah, that is, uh, that is a nice color. I do like that. Now, a lot of people think traditional watercolors have to be all transparent, but you can use opaque ones as well, and they're just as nice. So I'm not too picky on that. And this is the Viridian Hue. And this is a really pretty color as well. It's very vibrant. This looks a lot like the uh, Windsor Newton Viridian Hue as well. And I find doing swatches like this just so, um, like, meditative almost. All right, then we have a Terra Verte. Terra Verte? Not sure how you pronounce that one, but it almost looks like a really nice moss green type color. And again, it looks like there's white that's been added to this, maybe. Maybe. 
Oh, that is a pretty color though. I'm saying that for a lot of these, but it really is. I don't think I have a color like this uh, in my any of my sets. And I like dragging the colors out here so I can kind of see the the gradient, the variation that I can get in there from the darkest to the lightest. All right, so then we've got sap green. Oh, and this is a very yellowy, beautiful sap green. I love that. A lot of my sap greens that I have are a little more like muted on the muted side. They're not quite um, yellowy. Like this looks like a perfect like leaf green type color. I don't know. It's just like a perfect yellow green. And I use my Windsor Newton sap green a lot. So I'll show you the difference afterwards um, and just comparing them. Well, actually I'll show you in just a second. Um, because that one definitely isn't as vibrant and yellowy green as this one is. This is the sap green that I've been looking for. Oh, and look, you can drag that out so it's like a lot more on the yellowy side. Oh, that's beautiful. All right, so if you look here, so this is my Windsor Newton sap green, and that's that sap green. So you can see it's a much like darker. Even when you um, kind of try to lighten it, you can't see as much yellow in the mix, but this one you can. So I love that about that. And I've done up that swatch card, so I've got um, the new Windsor Newton paints. Uh, maybe we'll go ahead and swatch those after as well because I'm not going to make a dedicated video about those so maybe we'll do that next. This is permanent green too. Not sure if I'm as in love with this color but it's a nice just bright green. Oh, I can get a nice soft version of it though. Then I've got permanent green one, which seems a little bit more yellowy, a little lighter. And these colors are just rewetting really nicely. Oh, I like this one. And I don't have a lot of light green colors like this as well. So that's really nice. Then we've got this emerald green Nova. I don't know if I would call this emerald green, but there's definitely some white in there. So it's interesting that Holbein is including white in quite a few of these colors, or it looks like it anyway. I'll have to go a little more in depth into some of the pigment numbers and we'll talk about the uh, light fastness and all that in the review video but just looking at it uh, it does look a little more opaque
but if you're looking for colors like that, then these might be right up your alley. But again, you can still like lighten it out so it looks fairly transparent, so that's interesting. It doesn't look chalky to me, like a lot of these colors that I thought had white in it as well uh, definitely don't look chalky when you've blended them out. Now the cerulean blue hue has a little bit of granulation going on as well, so so far a tiny bit in the cobalt violet, maybe the mineral violet. Actually the mineral violet looks like it's dried pretty flat, so I would say the cobalt violet light the ultramarine deep and the cerulean blue so far have slight amounts of granulation, the ultramarine deep and the cobalt violet being the most. So I'm assuming there's a little bit of ultramarine violet in the cobalt violet, perhaps. Um, but yeah, those are the ones that I notice it a little bit more in so far. But not terribly, like I would still use these colors no problem and a lot of people love the granulating colors like i have a daniel smith palette like this um because i did go through a phase where i wanted more granulating colors and i still like them um, but i find i'm gravitating towards more smooth colors now as well i guess it just depends what mood i'm in this is cobalt green oh that is that is a really pretty color too and i find i like uh my Daniel Smith gran granulated colors, especially for backgrounds. If I just want to do like a really fun, loose background, I'll grab that palette and use those colors. I started with the Jean Hines, I think that's how you say it, uh, set, I believe there was like eight or ten colors in it. They were all very pretty uh, granulating colors. So if you want to just test them out, but you don't want to buy a whole lot, I would definitely recommend that set. And I got that on Amazon, so maybe I'll try to link it uh, down below. Now this is olive green. Oh, this is a really pretty olive green. I'm just trying to get it pigmented enough so it really shows off. Like you can see, it's almost like a brownie olive green, very pretty. Love that. I don't know that I have an olive green in any of my other palettes. Maybe in my Daniel Smith, I might have something that's similar to that, but I'm pretty sure it's a super granulating color. So when it spreads out, I think it's got like brown and green, like different browns and greens in it. That's a really pretty one too. And I'm pretty sure that color was in that Jean Hines palette. I hope it's Jean Hines. I will correct myself up here if I'm wrong. And she also had um, an opera rose in her set as well, which was really pretty. Now this is, what is it, Jaune Brilliant number two. This is a really interesting color. It almost looks like they were trying to make like a base skin tone or something. Like it's a very light, peachy, pink, creamy color. There's definitely uh, got some water, or some water, some white uh, mixed in here. I want to get a little bit darker, I think, just so I can show what it looks like a little bit more opaque but this definitely looks like uh if they were trying to make like a base skin tone that you could just mix some colors into um so that might be interesting to try to see if you mix a little bit of like red or green or purple orange whatever different combinations um, and just see what you could come up with and see if you could use this color potentially as a base color I'd be interested to see what mixes are in here. I'd definitely say there's a white and probably like an orangey red or something, maybe a yellow in there, but it is a, it is a nice color. So maybe that would be a fun video idea. Um, and then I could break down the base colors that in there. So if you don't have this color, you might be able to duplicate the, um, the ratio of the colors so that could be interesting let me know if you want to see that as well now this looks like a yellow ochre yes yellow ochre i 
Oh, I need just a, just a dip in the water, a little bit more water to get that to flow. That seems like just a typical yellowy, light yellowy brown, yellow ochre. Reminds me a lot of the Windsor Newton one. I think it's fairly close. This might be, this might be a little bit more brownie than the Windsor Newton one, I want to say. Let's have a quick look and compare. So this is my Windsor and Newton one, and I would say it's fairly close. Um, this one might be a little bit more pigmented than this one, um, but they're about the same. This one's actually got a little bit more brown in it. Uh, it might be my Winds, uh, not my Windsor Newton, might be my Daniel Smith one then that's very pale. I have one that's a really pale um, yellow ochre, and it's nice. It is nice, but uh, I like the ones that have a little bit more brown in it because they're really nice for, like, animal portraits if you need a, a very light beigey brown color. Um, yellow ochre is perfect for that and then you can throw in some burnt sienna like this is a uh, burnt sienna here. You could throw in some sepia to darken it up a little bit, some burnt umber. Um, I really like using the yellow ochre as a base for those um, paintings and then you can really just jazz it up with any color. Or you could add a little bit orange to it um, and this is a very like um, almost like a rusty burnt sienna I really like this color very orange orange rusty burnt sienna Yeah, that's a really pretty color. That one might slightly granulate. I can see a little bit of texture in there, but I saw that with the mineral violet and then it dried really smooth. So we'll see how this one dries out. All right, and this is the burnt umber. I don't have a lot of burnt umber. Um, I picked one up just recently uh, in the Windsor Newton Professionals, so we'll go ahead and swatch that after as well. But this is a really pretty burnt umber. Mm. It's almost like a chocolate brown, and I love mixing chocolate browns. I usually use uh, burnt sienna and sepia for that. So if you don't have this color, you can uh, use those two colors to get this. But this is a nice, convenient um, color to use. Yeah, that's a really, really nice color. Now this is the Sepia. Sepia is one of my favorites as well. This is definitely a nice dark Sepia. I'm just trying to get in there and get enough pigment so I can kind of see how far I can go. Oh, I wonder if they have white mixed in this. No, maybe not. Just seemed a little bit more opaque on the palette. Oh, I've got hair there. But now that I'm laying down, I, I don't really think there's any white in there. That is a really nice color, though. I like that as well. And you can use this color to get some darks, too. So you could mix that with, like, a really dark blue. Usually I'll do sepia and indigo um, from Windsor Newton. And you can get something that's fairly close to ivory black as well uh, doing that. Or you could do lighter versions of them to get grays. 
You can also use, um, I really like an orange, like my transparent orange and my either indigo or um, phthalo blue from Winter & Newton. And you can get a huge variety of grays from that all the way up to a, a black. So those are some nice combinations as well. Actually, I should make a video of different ways that you can mix grays and blacks. So if you want to see that video, let me know. This is just a bunch of video ideas coming out here um, <laughs> in this. So maybe those are all good videos to make in the future. Now this is ivory black and I don't typically use just straight black in my palette. I'm not opposed to it. If you want to use just straight black, go right ahead. But I find it can look a little flat and if I want to mix dark colors, um, I like using my neutral tint more. I can get a wide range of values out of that. It can go almost black to a very light, light gray. So I usually choose that over just a black color like this, but you know, if you wanna use just black, you do you. There are no rules saying that you can't. You do whatever you want. I see a lot of videos where like, oh, you shouldn't use black or you shouldn't use this or you shouldn't use white. There are no rules. Do what you want, you know. Don't let anybody else hold you back from creating anything just because you don't have a certain color or you don't have a certain supply. Use what you have. You know, you definitely do not need all of these colors. So take, you know, take that with a grain of salt when you hear stuff like that. Are they nice? Absolutely. Do you need them all? No. <laughs> so that's why I like to do a variety. I try to do some videos where I have a limited palette and then some videos where I'll use all of the colors that I want to use. So this is gray of gray. This is an interesting color. It just almost looks like a an off white. Hmm. It's not quite like a titanium buff color because that's more on the warm side. This is more like a cool gray, like a very light cool gray, but there's definitely um, a white mixed into this. So I wonder if they just took like the ivory black and the white and mixed that up together. It's kind of interesting. I don't know if I would have a lot of uses for this color, but it might be so, kind of fun to play around. Like I could see if maybe you had bricks or concrete or something like that, um, you could use that color for. But other than that, I'm not really sure what I would use this color for, but it's there. And then we've got our Chinese white last. And I'm going to try to pick up quite a bit of this because I really want to see like how opaque it can get if I really run my brush in here. Because most white watercolors will never be able to get as opaque as gouache. So I'm just interested. Okay, I'm going to give it a few little brush strokes over that. And actually, it looks opaque when you first put it down, but we'll have to see how it dries. Because as we know, most watercolors do shift and dry a little bit lighter than when you first put them down. Some dry a lot whiter than when you first put them down. So it just depends. And then I have one little lonely spot here that I guess I could designate to another color. So if I ever want to pick up another color from the whole binds, I could put it there. But like I said, I might not keep the, the white, the gray of gray, or the ivory black. So potentially I could have four new spots there. I could just cut out a little piece of paper and just stick them over it. Now the only swatch I'm not happy with is this Prussian blue. So you can see how it did cause a little bit of a back run there. So that might be a color that might be a little bit finicky. The rest of them are pretty good. So I might just try to do another little swatch over our Prussian blue there and just see if I can get it a little bit smoother and a little bit more pigmented because you can see the color in the palette compared to there that dried a lot more muted. 
I just want to see if I can get like a, a little bit more color down. Kind of just at the top here and then I'm just going to do the same thing. And this will kind of see how they layer. Okay, so it didn't, I didn't feel like the color was picking up or moving underneath and you know, we've been doing this all in real time here. So didn't have too much time to dry enough time, but uh, I feel like I was able to get a nice smoother swatch there over top. So we'll see how that one dries. So those are all of the Holbein colors in the 33 set, plus um, the Imidazolone yellow and the Quinacridone red that I picked up. So I hope you guys enjoyed this swatching part as well, and I know this is going to be a very long video, but you guys did want that. I did ask in a poll, so here you go. I hope you enjoy this. If you want to see more like swatching and more talking videos like this, let me know because I really don't mind doing them, but sometimes longer videos don't perform as well on YouTube, so I try to keep them a little bit more shorter. But to be honest, I want to do the content that you guys want to watch, so just let me know down below. But thank you so much for watching. Stay tuned for the review videos of the Holbein and the Paul Rubens watercolors and anything else that I've mentioned in here that uh, I'm going to review. So, you know, make sure you stay tuned for those videos. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, I will see you in the next one.